We're live! Hey, good afternoon everybody. Welcome back to CS109. How are you guys doing today? Oh, fantastic. I love to hear that. I hope you guys are having a splendid Friday and you're looking forward to a great weekend. Everything okay? Oh. Oh, we're waiting for the screen to pop up. Oh! It's probably much easier for the screen to pop up if the HDMI is plugged in. I believe that. Do, 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 do. And there we have it. Okay, thank you very much. Wonderful, wonderful people from SCPD. Okay, a couple quick announcements before we get started. Um, problem set one has its due date today, uh, though there is a grace period, so if you are still making some small tweaks, that's okay. Problem set two, though, will go out today, so if you're still working on problem set one, you'll be, you know, have less time to work on this new problem set that's just gone out. Uh, and then happy Friday, I'll tell you a quick story. And then for those of you who went to Python review session one, there's now Python review session two, uh, and that will be on Zoom after class uh, and also will be recorded in case you can't make it. Just want to talk really quickly about the Python, or sorry, about the problem sets. So problem set one was due here. You have a grace period that lasts until tomorrow. If for some reason you really, really need an extension, you can go all the way until next Wednesday, but after next Wednesday, we wouldn't accept anything because we've started grading, uh, and then you'll get your feedback next Friday. So one week from when you submit it to when you get your feedback. Though, of course, hopefully everyone's done by now because then you can work on problem set two, and problem set two is due on the 17th. And in fact, you basically know everything you need to know to do problem set two. If you guys were really feeling it, over this weekend, you could be done with problem set two and really ahead of the game for CS109. I know that will be a low percentage of people, but maybe that low percentage of people could be you. And if it's not for you guys, then you know, we'd be like rocking and rolling and just enjoying and learning everything we can about probability. There's some really cool things in problem set two. One of my favorite things that we've added is we're gonna make you program this Bayes medical test in every possible combination. You have to write a general solution to Bayes. Uh, and this is a relatively new thing in CS109, but the point is to make sure that you really understand this most fundamental concept that we have studied so far. The hardest thing in the problem, or one of the other ways that we're gonna push you is we're going to make you think about Bayes' theorem in a more generalized world than we've seen in lecture. In lecture, we've talked about Bayes' theorem where an event can happen or it can happen. But we're going to push you in the problem set to think about, well, what if there's many different possible outcomes? And here's one concrete example. Imagine you're tracking an object, and it could be in any of these nine locations. I can give you a prior belief about where the object is. I can give you uh, the probability of an observation that is made given each location. So I can say, you know, here's the chance that your object's in this location. I can tell you how likely is an observation, like a distance to a satellite tower or something like that, given each location. And then using Bayes' theorem, you can update your belief about where the object is. Now, Bayes' theorem should just look like this. You know, what's your belief of a new location giving an observation? You can just use your regular Bayes' theorem. The interesting thing here is, you know, how do you deal with this denominator when your world isn't necessarily split into location five or not location five. This denominator, we've always expanded using the law of total probability, but I just want to clue you guys into this idea that that law of total probability, if your world is split into nine nice locations, you can write the law of total probability like this. For every location, what's the probability of the observation and the location? And that's just another way to get your probability of observation. But just, you know, on this problem set, we're going to give you an opportunity to extend Bayes' theorem by programming it for all situations and also extend your knowledge of Bayes' theorem by thinking about it in a context where there could be perhaps nine outcomes instead of just two. Yeah. Okay, um, fantastic. Uh, there's a cool problem on the problem set that extends that bat uh, genome question we brought up yesterday, or on Wednesday's class, it's going to require that you actually write some Python off of the browser. So if you don't already have Visual Studio Code or some other programming environment, you're going to want to do that for problem set two. Okay. <laughs>
questions, comments, concerns about logistics? I have a quick story for you. I really like this story. It's, it takes place in CS109 not too long ago. Um, and a student had come to my office hours a few times. It was a student who had never seen any probability before CS109. And all this was very new to the student. Uh, and by the end of class, found this beautiful connection between what we'd been studying and her life. So she had been playing this game called Ultimate Frisbee. Uh, you guys probably have heard about it. And did you guys know that when you start a game of Ultimate Frisbee, there's this interesting game that's played. The two captains go and they both flip a Frisbee. And then one of the captains, while it's flipping, claims heads or, or evens or odds. If the, if the person says evens, if they're either both up or both down, then that team starts. And if it's odds, that means one's up and one's down. And we were thinking about this in CS109, and it turns out this game is not fair. And the person who figured it out, this student, you know, went on to take this concept, got published in a magazine, the Ultimate Frisbee magazine, made a YouTube video that became quite popular. And I think it tells the story of probability is not just what we do with the problem sets. It's something that lives all over. And if you can start to understand this language, you can better understand all the different things that you might find interesting in your world. Uh, and so just by taking 109, you know, made some small improvement in the world of probability. Uh, and at the end of class, just for some excitement, we're going to do a little bit more gambling. So just a little bit of a heads up. We'll talk more about that when we get there. Okay, we should do some review. We've talked about some of the most foundational ideas in probability. And you guys have worked very, very hard to make sure that you understand each of those concepts. And if you've made it to this point, you have this beautiful baseline. And I just want to talk about what's on that, in that foundation. So we've got these core ideas and probabilities, just some definitional understandings of probability. We have ways that we can think about conditional probabilities, relations between conditional probabilities, probability of and. We have relationship between conditional probabilities and probabilities without condition. And we have relationships between a conditional probability and co conditional probability written the other direction. And on Wednesday's we, class, we really focused on understanding how you can do probability of or either in the case where you have something that's mutual exclusive, in which case it's easy, you just add, or if you don't have mutual exclusivity, in which case you can use inclusion and exclusion. We also talked about how probability of and is made a lot easier by this other property called independence. There are two different properties. If you have events that are independent, probability of and becomes multiplication, and if you have events that are not independent, probability of and um, is chain rule. Now, we have been implicitly using this thing called De Morgan sometimes to go between the probability of or and the probability of and. And De Morgan's kind of says, you know, the probability of E or F, if you take the not of that, it becomes 1 minus the probability of E and F. Or, sorry, do, 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 do. the not of that becomes the probability of E complement and F complement. People often find this a little bit intuitive. A lot of people have already been using it in the problems that we've talked about. But if you find it hard to go between ors and ands, you probably want to revisit De Morgan's, which is something you would have covered uh, in some of the set theory prior to CS109. To bring this all together, I did want us to start practicing. And that, in fact, I was going to have us practice by thinking about that problem, that Fisbee problem uh, that I mentioned. Do you know when you flip a frisbee, it's not equally likely to be heads or tails. That's what makes this so interesting. So I want you guys to imagine a world where if you flip a frisbee, we're going to call the upside heads and the downside tails. Uh, and I'm going to say there's a 60% chance of getting that upside. So if two frisbees are considered even, if either both of them are heads or both of them are tails, what's the probability that if you flip two frisbees, they're even? And this is just a warm up to bring together the foundation we've talked about. Talk to the person next to you, see if you can figure this out. What's the probability that, they're that the two Frisbees are even? OK. Let's do this together. I'd say one of the hidden skills in CS109 is can you take a word problem and can you define events? And once you define events, then can you express the problem in terms of those events? Uh, and this one, I think it's a lot easier if you can s to solve this problem if you can see that there's two events, whether or not you get a heads on Frisbee 1 and whether or not you get a head on Frisbee 2. Uh, 
And then you can recognize that this question is asking either h1 and h2 or h1 complement and h2 complement. I don't know, do you guys find it a little bit easier once you've defined events? Certainly this is a warm-up problem, but if you get to like meteor problems, defining events is absolutely critical. <laughs> now, this or would be super easy if a certain property was held. What's that property? Mutually exclusive. Yeah, and, and mutually exclusivity means that they can't happen at the same time. Are these two things mutually exclusive? Ah, yeah. oh, fantastic. Why? Well, you can't both get tails and both get heads. That's impossible. Uh, these are two different, um, of, they're mutually exclusive events, therefore the probability we care about is just going to be the sum of these two probabilities. Now let's look at one of these, probably of h1 and h2. We're looking for an and, so what's the, what's the property we care about? Independence. Is the first frisbee independent of the second frisbee? Yes. Yeah, we think frisbees are independent, which means that this just becomes the probability of h1 times the probability of h2. Uh, and we know what the probability h1 is. We're given that's 0 0.6, and we're given that this is 0 0.6. For similar reasons over here, this is going to be equal to 0 0.4 squared. Great. Actually, just for fun, this is like really not the sort of thing you'd have to invent on the fly, but just for a good time, what do you guys, could you guys invent an algorithm that would be fair, given that I'm going to give you frisbees, they're equally likely to be heads, you just don't know what the probability of heads is. And if I give you two frisbees that are equally likely to be heads, you don't know what the probability, you don't, you know, like maybe it's 0.6, maybe it's 0.7, the probability of heads. Could you come up with a game that would be fair? So this is an unfair way to start, it turns out. If you plug in any number that's not 0.5, you're more likely to win if you call evens. Can we come up with a game that's better? So that, there's a quick clarifications before I, I throw you guys to just think about this with the person next to you. You guys up for a Friday challenge? You don't have to, but like, see if you can. Maybe, maybe you'll come up with something. So um, you have these two Frisbees, some game that would be actually fair. And then I'll tell you about it in, in about a minute and a half. So talk to the person next to you. OK. Maybe you came up with this. This is a cheeky problem, but I find it kind of like a fun algorithmic challenge. The answer, there is an answer. There might be a more efficient algorithm. And if you guys came up with a more efficient, efficient algorithm, you should certainly talk to me. But here's a, a rather inefficient algorithm that is fair. Loop forever. You're like, this is supposed to be done before you start the game? Bear with me. You're going to flip both frisbees. If they're odd, that means one was a heads and one was a tails, whoever has the heads wins. So if you think about it, what's your chance of winning? Well. In the case where they're odd, either you got a head tail or a tail heads. And the probability of a head tail is p times 1 minus p. And the probability of tail heads is p times 1 minus p. So both these outcomes are just as likely. Now there is this prob problem where like, there's also the outcome of them being even. But in that case, if it's even, you re just repeat and no one's more likely than the other person to win. Uh, you could get into a deep recursive proof if you find this interesting. Uh, and certainly, as I mentioned, you know, this could go on for a long time. You could flip, they're both the same. You flip, they're both the same. You flip, they're both the same. You flip, they're different, and then it's over. And that seems like a pretty inefficient algorithm, though fair. Uh, and if somebody thinks of a more efficient one, that would be so cool. Yeah? I don't understand why it's fair. When, when does tails go? Uh, so, uh, do, do, what does tails mean? So that means one frisbee's up and one frisbee's down. So you kind of keep going until the frisbees are in different orientations, and then whoever had the heads in that uh, situation is the person who wins. And you're just as likely to have this combination, what, you have heads, the other person has tails, as uh, you have tails and the other person has heads. As I said, not really reasonable for me to make you invent algorithms on the spot, but just to show you what work in this field could look like. It's both doing probability, but sometimes algorithms that uh, work with probabilities. Yes? Just to clarify why this is true, it's kind of like saying, while they're odd, 
the person with head wins. The person with the heads out of the two wins. Yes, exactly. And if they're even, what do you do? Um, you start over again. Yeah, you just keep playing. So you just keep playing until you enter the world where they're odds. And in the world where they're odds, um, it's just as likely that one person uh, wins as the other. What a wild time. Yeah. Can you explain why this has like an exact probability of like half of each player? Uh, yeah, do you, so the probability, if you enter the world where uh, this is true, so like when you stop, you know that you're in either of these two conditions. And so you can imagine the, the chance that one person wins is this probability divided by the probability that you end up in this world. Um, and then if you do a law of total probability, just be this plus. 1 minus p, you'd end up with something like this, which would give you 1 half. So that's like the chance that you end up in this condition, conditioned off the fact that you've already entered the world where uh, they are odd. And these are the two ways you can get odd. Exactly. Tails, heads, or heads, tails. Okay. Ta da! So you can think about this like, what's the probability person one wins condition off getting odds? OK, great. Uh, and actually, I want to do this because I know the earlier you start problem set two is a, a great marker of you're going to stay on track with this class. And I thought, what if I just did one of the problems in problem set two in class? And now you guys have all started problem set two. So who started problem set two? You can all raise your hand because that's you. Just go right up this. This is one of your questions, one of the warm-up ones. OK. Now, there was this major key that I, I'd like to restate. It's worth restating many times. You know, conditional probability is a new thing to get our heads around. When you condition on something, you enter a world where all the rules of probability still hold. So you know, I guess you can say, for example, if you consistently condition on E, for example, the Bayes theorem formula would still exist in the world where E is true. So once E's happen, Bayes theorem still, ha still occurs. You can talk, still talk about the probability of A given B as the probability of B given A. Notice how every formula here has a condition on E. In that world where E has happened, rules of probability still apply. Uh, and yeah, this is now the Bayes theorem. Cute, no? OK, not cute. <laughs> um, and then you know, I'm, I'm starting today by pushing you guys a little bit. Uh, and then and we'll go, the second part of today, we'll just go into something very definitional. So bear with me for just a moment. I did want to talk about these two different concepts at the same time. So we've learned conditional probability, and we learned independence. But what happens when you put those two things together? And it turns out quite a lot happens when you put them together. Let's go back to that cool program we ran on Wednesday. Do you guys remember we ran that program on Wednesday? We had all these genes in this trait. And after we ran the program, it said, here's how we think the genes influence the trait. Well, let's break this down a little bit. Here's the input that the program had to work with. It had examples of 100,000 bats. For every bat, you knew exactly the expression of the genes and whether or not a trait was expressed. The easiest thing you could do if you want to try and understand how these genes influence this trait is to look for independence. Independence is something we learned last time. Uh, and here's how I did it. The first thing I did is I took every single gene and I checked, does this gene look like it's independent of the trait? So to do that, I would calculate what's the probability of seeing the trait and the gene. And that's just counting. How many times did I see these two things at the same time divide my 100,000 bats? And that would give me a probability. Then I could say, what's the probability of the trait on its own? What's the probability of the gene on its own? And I can multiply those two things together. Do you guys remember independence? If two things are independent, it should be the case that the uh, probability of each event multiplied together should be the same as the probability of the and. Really quickly, let's do this. Do you think trait one is independent of G1? Do you think it's independent of gene two? Do you think gene three? Yeah. Ooh, a little controversial, though. They're not exactly equal. But it's data. Come on, there's only 100,000. We haven't seen infinite bats. So like, because we've only seen 100,000 bats, the fact that these two numbers are so close, I'm going to assume, yeah, they're looking pretty independent. Um, how about t tr uh, the trait in gene four? Yes. And the trait in gene five? Yes. 
So the trait looks like it's independent of gene three and gene four. That tells us so much. It's pretty reasonable to assume that knowing these genes doesn't change your belief in whether or not the trait will be expressed. So we kind of know that it's these genes that are changing beliefs of whether or not the trait is expressed. We learn so much by just looking at independence. And for our, my advanced concept of the day, I want to think, could we go a step further? And it turns out there is this thing a step further. It's a one step beyond what we teach you in CS109, but it's something that would be like one of the first concepts you'd learn if you took 228 or one of the more advanced classes. It's this idea of conditional dependence, and I want you to know it exists even if uh, you're not going to go so deep into it in 109. Conditional independence says, can we look for independence relationships in the case where I condition on another event? So here I'm going to condition on, I'm going to tell you what G2 is, that G2 is expressed. If I tell you that G2 is expressed, then I can calculate the probability of T and G5 in the world where G2 is expressed. And I can calculate the probability of G uh, in the world where G2 is expressed. And I can talk about the probability of G5 in the world where G2 is expressed. You know, to do this math uh, computationally is very easy. I just take my 100,000 examples and I only look at all the ones that are consistent with G2 being expressed. So maybe there's only like 20,000 examples where G2 is expressed and I'm only looking at those 20,000. Then I can say, what's the probability of T in those 20,000? What's the probability of G5 in those 20,000? And what's the probability of T and G5? Do you guys see how condition on G2, T looks like it's independent of G5? Was T independent of G5 before? No, a beautiful thing sometimes happens. When you condition on an event, it can change independence relationships. So in the world where I tell you what G2 is, it can now become the case that T and G5 are independent of one another. That's not the case if I didn't tell you what G2 was. And some of you are like, what? How can this possibly be? There's a few causal structures in the world that lead to exactly this. And here's one of them. G5 doesn't affect the trait directly. G5 makes it more likely for G2 to be expressed, and G2 is what influences the trait. So if I tell you whether or not G2 is expressed, G5 is not giving me any more information because G5 only changes my belief that G2 is expressed. So G5's causal mechanism is by making this more likely, which makes T more likely. We're not going to go into the depth of all the different causal structures and probability. Uh, you need to build a bigger foundation before we go there. Uh, but I did want to just bring into light what happens when we mix causality and, or sorry, uh, conditioning and independence. Technically, conditional independence looks like this. If you condition on some event consistently, E and F look conditionally independent if probably of both of them happening in the world where G's happen is equal to the probability of E happening condition on G times the probability of F happening condition on G. That's exactly what we observed before. Uh, it is equivalent to this, just like independence of E and F is similarly stated as probability of E given F equals probability of E. And that's conditional independence. And it looks just like the law of independence. It's just that the relationship might not be the same between conditional independence and independence. A question. So if you have some condition that's applying to pretty much that kind of permeates throughout your whole problem and you're essentially in the world of that condition, you can essentially like cancel out the condition and have things still work out. Oh, all the laws of probability would work. Yeah, so so one way that we sometimes express this notationally, just to restate your question, because it was a good question. If there is a world G that permeates your whole problem. Sometimes we don't write down conditioned on G. And let me give you an example. I roll my dice. There's a whole bunch of things that have happened in this universe before the dice was rolled. You know, it's like, what's the chance of me getting a two conditioned on I had a big lunch today? And there's all these things that are true. The laws of probability still hold even though I've had a big lunch today. But you know, if, if that event just permeates the whole problem, maybe you don't have to write it. Um, yeah. Sometimes these conditionings permeate the whole problem. You don't need to be explicit about it. And sometimes you have to be explicit because they matter. Yeah, question. Does this guarantee that E and F are like, regularly independent? That's such a good question. It's such a good question. I want everyone to hear that question. I want you guys all to be wondering about that question. If two things are conditionally independent, does it tell you anything about whether or not they're independent when you're not conditioning on G? 
This is the most bizarre thing. No, they're totally different things. Things can be independent, and then when you condition on G, they can look dependent again. Things can be totally dependent, but then when you condition on some other event, they can start to look independent. And it's because causality is such a crazy thing. But there is one major key. It's just that independence relationships can change with conditioning. The laws of probabilities still hold when you condition. It's just this property might change between two events. Yeah? So what's the point of conditional? It, uh, let me give you an example that explains why this is so useful, if I may. Uh, it comes from Netflix. So your question was like, what's, why is uh, conditional independence so useful? And it turns out it is a powerful thing to know. That's why I want to bring it to your attention now. So we talked a little bit about the probability that somebody likes this movie I, watch, I like called Life is Beautiful. And we said you can calculate the probability that somebody likes this movie just by counting in the Netflix data set. You know, if Netflix has a billion users, and if 100,000 watch this movie, you can say that probably somebody watches this movie is 100,000 over a billion. There's better numbers. Now, if you cared about a conditional probability, like the somebody, the probability that somebody watches this movie conditioned on the fact that they watch another movie, you could use the definition of conditional probability, and that would, when you reduce it, come out to figure out how many people watch the movie F and figure out what subset of them watch both movies. And if you look at that ratio, that would give you your conditional probability. Okay, probabilities with data, exciting times. You'll get to try this in problem set two. But what if you condition on more than one movie? What if there were, say, four movies or three movies that you're conditioning on? Like, you want to figure out what's the probability that somebody watches Life is Beautiful, but you want to condition on whether or not they've watched Nairobi Half-Life, Coda, and Three Idiots. Because Netflix is probably using a lot of information to update its belief on whether or not you'd watch a movie like Life is Beautiful. There's a little bit of a problem. First of all, do you think E4 is independent of E1, E2, E3? I see some shaking heads. That means no to me. And the reason I think no is a very good answer to this is knowing these three should change my belief about E4. If somebody tells me that a user likes or watched this movie and this movie and this movie, my belief is going to increase that they've watched movie four. So there's reason to believe that they're not independent. Uh, and because they're not independent, it is not true that you can just summarize probability of E4 with ignoring E1, E2, E3. You actually have to think about this using full conditional probability. Okay, so here's what you would do. You'd figure out what's the probability that somebody watches all four movies divided by the probability that they watch these three. That's the definition of conditional probability. We can use it right here. Fantastic. A problem's going to come up, though. Hmm. This is my problem. My problem is... Let's say I want to condition on somebody watching 30 movies. I have a counting problem for you. Let's say there's 13,000 titles on Netflix. A user watches 30 random titles. E is the event that they specifically watched the four I care about. So everybody watches 30 movies. How many people actually watch the exact four I care about? Uh, and that's something we can calculate using calc uh, probability. So a little bit of accounting problem for you guys. Something to talk about with the person next to you. You should use probably equally likely outcomes. How would you define your event space, your sample space? And then we can come up with this small, small, small probability. OK. We'll go back to talking about this. But I wanted to take a moment and see if somebody could help me out with the sample space, see if we can get on the same page with that. But what's the sample space that you guys use? We got 13,000 choose 30. So 13,000 choose 30. Every outcome here is a choice of 30 movies for, uh, for uh, out of the 13,000 movies that are possible. And we're going to say each of those outcomes is equally likely because every movie is just as likely as the other ones. These 30 movies don't necessarily contain the four we care about. How many ways can we get exactly the four we care about? That's the event space. Okay, take 30 more seconds, think about it a little bit more, and then we will come up with the answer together.
Okay. I have a two-step procedure for you guys. Every single outcome here includes all the ways you could choose 30 movies, but I want to find the subset of outcomes where they definitely have those four I care about. So here's a two-step process for constructing an outcome that has the four I care about. First, put the four you care about into the set we've chosen, and next, choose 26 other movies from the 12,996 remaining. So this will give you the probability of seeing exactly the four movies you care about. And unfortunately, if you were to bring this to a calculator, the probability of somebody watching exactly those four movies becomes incredibly small, 10 to the negative 11th. Now, I assume that people are equally likely to watch movies, and we know people have a little bit more pattern to that. But this does present a problem for us. If you're conditioning on a whole bunch of movies, you could very quickly enter the space where you need to do a probability of an event that looks pretty rare. Netflix has this really brilliant way of leveraging conditional independence to make this calculation a lot easier. What they do is they say there is another variable, there's another event, and that event is this user liking foreign emotional comedies. And they say it's this event that's really governing whether or not people like these four movies. And then they make an assumption. It's a wrong assumption, but it's a very, very helpful assumption. They say the probability that you like this movie is conditionally independent of you liking this other movie if I tell you that you like foreign emotional dramas. The information's all coming through whether or not you have this preference. And once I know if you have that preference, then whether or not you like these movies start to look independent. They make this crazy in conditional independence uh, assumption. Uh, and once you make this crazy independence assumption, then the probability of E4, given all of these things, and also given K1, is equal to the probability of E4 given K1. Their job has become much easier. They just have to infer whether or not you like this idea of a film, and then they're gonna base their belief of whether or not you like a particular movie within that genre on that other event that they defined. Super advanced stuff, but I just kinda wanna tease you as to where this stuff goes. And, and to give you a little bit of a, a further explanation of why I think this stuff is cool, conditional independence makes practical decomposing hard probability questions. Um, it is true, somebody said, if two things are dependent, they might not be dependent when you condition. Two things are independent, they might not be uh, independent when you condition. Um, and this idea of putting together conditioning independence, Judea Pearl, who won the 2011 Turing Award, said exploiting conditional dependence to generate fast probabil probabilistic computations is one of the main contributions CS has made to probability theory. So conditional independence, it's just like independence, it's just in the world where you condition on something. And the only gotcha is that independence and conditional independence aren't necessarily the same thing. You know, when you condition on events, that relationship can change. Uh, and then this fact that you can use independence in the conditional world can make some computations way, way easier. So hopefully at this point I've motivated you're like, okay, I appreciate conditional independence isn't just two random combinations of ideas, uh, it is something that might be worth feeling more comfortable with. Okay, so that was my advanced, that's one of the more advanced things that I'll talk about today. Uh, I'm gonna give you guys a pedagogical pause quite early and then we're going to go to our next CS109 episode. See if you can summarize what we've talked about today before we learn about our next concept. We're gonna learn about random variables, what a good time. So take two minutes and then we will continue our journey. Okay, let's bring it back together and I just want to point out a cool thing. Look, I know I've thrown so much at you. I gave you like law of total probability, I gave you Bayes theorem, I gave you definition of conditional independence. We talked about independence and mutual exclusivity so you can do probably or and probably of and. And that's a whole bunch but what you guys have done now is you've come to this really important place in probability understanding. You have touched what I would call core probability. You're at this interesting part in CS109 where you have seen all the fundamental pieces. And now we're just going to start using those fundamental pieces to do ever more interesting things. The first interesting thing we're going to do is we're going to start defining families of patterns with these core principles that we're going to call random variables. 
And once you understand random variables, that's going to be our basis for AI. You guys have made a lot of progress. I hope you feel good. I know it's been confusing for a lot of people because it's a hard thing to get your head around, but uh, good on you for putting in all that hard work to get here. The next CS109 episode is about random variables, and this is not going to be as conceptually intense as thinking about conditional independence. Uh, it is instead just going to be new terminology. This is like the chat that us probability experts use. You're going to be learning a new lexicon for talking about things you already know. I want to set out a couple learning goals for today. By the end of today, I want you to be able to define a random variable. I want you to be able to use and produce this thing we call a probability mass function, and I want you to be able to calculate expectation. This is a pretty reasonable set of things that we're going to be able to do uh, in the next 40 minutes. I'm going to start by introducing you to this idea of random variables by going back to the days of defining variables in code. Uh, and this is what it looks like to define variable in C++ or Java. Uh, and when you define a variable in code, what a powerful idea. Imagine you're coding life before you have variables and you're coding life after you have variables. Uh, you know, technically, you could probably do a lot of those programs without any variables, but they'd just be very, very messy. Well, actually, no, not possible. A variable in code, what does it have? It has a type. You know, maybe it's integer, maybe it's a Boolean. It has a name and it has a value. And it allows you to put data and think about it in a, a, a principled way. Here's another variable. This has a different type. It's a double, has a different name, and it has a different value. There's a whole bunch of different types that you can have of variables, uh, and they're a very practical idea. The one thing you don't see so explicitly in code that maybe would be really nice would be just saying, I have a variable, and it can take on just exactly one of these values. Probability has an analogy to a programming variable. But it's slightly different in that we're going to be thinking about variables. They're going to take on values. We just don't know what value it's going to take on yet. And we think about there being some uncertainty as the value it takes on. So for example, you can have an integer. And that integer could be like the number of pirate ships in our future armada. I was like going through a pirate thing when I wrote this slide, just forgive all the pirate uh, examples. And you can say I have a random variable. It's going to take on the values 1, 2. We're definitely going to have at least one vote. 1, 2, up to 10. And it will be a value. It will take on a number. We just don't know at this point exactly what that number is. And we think there's some randomness that governs that number. Similarly, you could say the amount of money we get after we defeat Blackbeard, that's going to be maybe a double or a you know, continuous number. And in probability, we would name that as a random variable. It's not a regular variable because we don't yet know how much money we're going to get. And we think that there's maybe some probability distribution over all the values you could get. Uh, and then you know, probability random variables can also have the variable type of something like a true or a false. Uh, there's this idea of, OK, C is going to be 1 if you successfully raid Ila de Muerta and 0 otherwise. And then you can say C, it's a variable. It will take on the value 0 or 1. We just don't know yet if it will take on 0 or 1. We think there's some uncertainty. So it's just going to be new terminology for something that we already, or for formulas that we've already seen. So random variable. Variable. It's going to have a value, and there's just uncertainty as to what that value is. More examples. If I say I have three, or I flip a coin three times, I could define a random variable to be the number of heads on those three coin flips. Why is a random variable? Will it take on a number? Yeah, eventually, after I flip the coins, do we know which number it'll take on? No, not yet. We do know it's going to be either 0, 1, 2, or 3. And there's a probability that it takes on 0. There's going to be a probability that it takes on 1, a probability that it takes on 2, and a probability that it takes on 3. So just like a random variable, there's just uncertainty as to what value it takes on. To be clear, we could actually calculate the probability it takes on different values. We can say, what's the probability that it's 0? Well, that means you've got a tails, tails, tails. What's the probability that you get a 1? So that y random variable could take on the value 0. It could take on the value 1. That means you got 1 heads, which is, means you either got in the first flip, the second flip, or the third flip. Uh, you could get 2 heads, which means you need head, head, tails, or head, tails, tails, or tails, head, head. Uh, or you could even get 3 heads. And there is a 1 out of 8 chance of that. So random variable is just going to be a new name for a variable for whom we don't know its value yet. Uh, the probability that it takes on some number greater than 4 is 0, 
You could talk about the probability that takes on a negative number, but that's also zero. We think of it only as having non-negative probabilities for zero, one, two, and three. I think there's just one confusing thing that I'd like you guys to separate. I've just introduced you to this world of random variables. It's gonna be a nice, happy world, but the thing I want you to distinguish and contrast it against is the world of events. Because random variables and events are different things. Um, okay. And we'll just keep that contrast in your mind. Now, on Wednesday's class, we talked about what happens if your coin doesn't come up with equal likelihood of being heads or tails. So if you say you have five coin flips, each is independently coming up heads with a probability of P. You know, from Wednesday's class, we figured out that this is gonna be five choose two. So choose all the ways that you can put your two heads. And then the outcome of each of those events is gonna be the Head, probably the heads squared, because there's two of them, and the probability of tails cubed, because there's three of them. If you don't remember how we got there, there's that wonderful example in the course reader, and it's certainly worth revisiting until you feel comfortable with the probability of exactly two heads when your coin isn't 50-50. Um, so if your y's number of heads on five coin flips and p is the probability of getting heads, then you can get uh, a probability function that looks a little bit like this. Okay, what are the three things, the three most important things you can say about a random variable is somebody can give you a function. Somebody, a very kind soul, might tell you, here's the probability of every outcome of a random variable. And on some level, this is one of the main functions of a, a random variable. A main function of a random variable is somebody can give you a whole bunch of probabilities at once. They can maybe tell you the probability of any assignment to the random variable. We call that the probability mass function. When you have a random variable, you can also calculate these statistics that you've probably heard about before, like expectation and variance. But we need to have this idea of a random variable before we can do those. And our learning goals for today is really to master these first two steps. So let's jump into it. Let's talk about this probability mass function. The relationship between the random variables, values it can take on, and the chance of it occurring is a function. Let me convince you of this. Here is a random variable. For example, this random variable could be the number of heads in five coin flips. This is an event. And actually, I'm going to go back and forth between these two one more time because I want you to see the difference. This is a random variable. It's the number of outcomes on five coin flips. It's not an event. But if you say, the number of outcomes, uh, uh, heads on five coin flips is two, that's an event. In fact, any Boolean operation you do with a random variable will make an event. Like if I say y is less than two, that's an event. The number of heads being less than two, that's an event. But the number of outcomes on five coin flips, it's not an event, it's more like an experiment. So maybe I wanna pause here and take a question. So, Random variables, they're variables that can take on values with probabilities, and they're different than events. You can go between them by asking a Boolean question of your random variable. So that was a random variable, this is an event. Any questions about this? Yes? Why can the, um, why can the event only be a Boolean value? Like why can't it just be a non that's a good, events are always Boolean. You made a good observation. Every time in probability somebody talks to you about an event, it's either true or false. It either happens or it doesn't happen. That's a good observation. Yes? So the random variable with a Y, yes. this is the event. Exactly. The probability of a random variable is different to the random variable itself. Yeah, and that's a good question. It turns out, yes, and, and probability of these things are different than the events themselves. And you raise a good point. You can ask the probability of an event, but you can't ask the probability of a random variable on its own. So it makes sense to ask, what's the probability that y is less than two? But it doesn't make sense to ask, what's the probability of y? You can say, what's the probability that y equals zero? You can say, what's the probability of y equals two? You can say, what's the probability that y is greater than five? But you can't say just probability of y on its own. Probabilities always want to be over events. That was a fantastic question. Okay, you guys ready to go up a notch? So if y equals two is an event, then if you put two in, 
This is going to be a probability, a number between 0 and 1. Are you guys following? I'm just trying to construct this up slowly. y is a random variable, y equals 2 is an event, and the probability that y equals 2 will be a number between 0 and 1. Final idea. If you let this be a variable, what you now have is a function. If you put in different values for k, you should get out different probabilities. If you put in 1, you should get the probability that y equals 1. If you put in 2, you should get the probability that y equals 2. And this is mathematically what we call a function. You can think about functions in lots of ways. One way is you can think of it as just being an input-output relationship. You can put k equals 5 here, and you should get out a probability. You can also think about functions the programming way. You know, if this is a function, you could write it up as code. And it could be a function, and the parameter is k. If you pass in a 1, this function should give you back the probability that y equals 1. If you pass in a 2, it should give you back the probability that y equals 2. OK, you buying me with this function idea? Yes? Just to be clear, so y is a random variable, and k is just a variable? Yeah, exactly. That's a good, good question. y is a random variable, so we think about taking on values with different probabilities. And k is just a, like a variable in programming that you can just put in as a parameter. And those are two different concepts. We use a lower case for like the programming variable concept and uppercase for the random variable concept. That's such a great question. OK. So if a random variable is discrete, and by discrete I mean it takes on integer values or whole numbers, uh, we call this function the probability mass function. It's possibly the most important thing to know for a random variable. So if I say of a random variable, the first thing you should wonder is, what's its probability mass function? What's the relationship between all the values it could take on and the probabilities? There's some shorthands for it. Some people write this. Some people write this. In CS109, I'll almost always try and write the full event out. You know, this feels a little bit redundant. You've got, what's the probability that this random variable takes on the value of this programming variable? Uh, and then some people are like, well, because they're both called x, I could just skip the random variable and just write the shorthand. You might see that in the probability paper. Now, let me show you some probability mass functions. Again, since they're functions, I can represent them as code. I can represent them as equations. I can also represent them as just drawings, right? I can give you a graph that gives a relationship between all the inputs of the function and the outputs. Here is a probability mass function for rolling a single dice. What are all the different outcomes of rolling a single dice? You could get a 1, you get a 2, you get a 3, you get a 4, you get a 5, you get a 6. And this most important definition, the, the relationship between those numbers and their probabilities is called the probability mass function. And in this case, all of those inputs lead to a probability of 1, 6. If you roll a dice and x is the outcome of your dice, the probability of x taking on any value is going to be 1, 6. Not the most exciting example, but I'm really just trying to get you into this new terminology that we're going to build on as we go towards artificial intelligence. Let's do something a little bit more exciting. Let's say x is the sum of two dice rolls. We've talked a lot about two dice rolls, right? We've talked about how you could calculate the probability that two dice rolls is equal to two or three or four. The probability mass function is going to put all that information into one place. So you don't have to individually calculate the probability that two dice roll is seven. You could just go to the probability mass function and look it up and know that uh, for seven it's going to be six over 36. The probability mass function could be given to you like this. It could also be given to you like that. Any way you could define a function, programming, math, a graph, all those are valid ways of giving somebody the relationship between the values a random variable can take on and the probabilities. I'll pause here for a second, because that's kind of cool. Also, you're like, whoa, that looks like a triangle. Awesome. <laughs> yes, question. What about like when the random variable isn't discrete, like with the, the Blackbeard's um, yeah, we will get to non-discrete in about a week. But for now, we're just being in the happy world where random variables are discrete, which means all their values uh, um, are whole numbers. OK, fantastic. Does this, um, I hope I've put enough energy into explaining this that you're like, this feels kind of obvious. What is the probability of mass function telling us that <laughs> knowing that the, I guess the original probability of rolling a 7 wouldn't? Yeah, it's a good point. It's giving it to all, like imagine somebody gave you this programming function. It's just somebody's done the work for you. It's like if I've done the work of figuring out the probability of all these different assignments to x, probably, you can think of the probability mass function as a way for me to encapsulate that work and hand it over to another person. So it's allowing you to know that the probability of two dice roll being 7 is 6 over 36 without having to do that work. 
And you can imagine this will be nicer later. When we, when we derive really complicated probabilities, it will be nice to be able to put them into packages and then use them later on, say, your midterm. So your midterm, you want to use a really complicated process, but you're like, oh, earlier in class we derived it, we put it into a random variable, I can just refer to that random variable and directly use this probability mass function. So it's going to allow us to build off the work of others. Help? Good, good, good. Fantastic question. Okay, I do want to make you think about something. Imagine those two dice rolls. I'm going to sum over all values of k. So 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. k are all the outcomes of the sum of two dice. If I sum over each of those and add the probability that y takes on a particular value, what is this sum going to come to? Talk to the person next to you because this is an important, this is fine check to make sure that you guys are following along and to push you also to think about what this means. Okay, if you didn't get this, this is fine, but it's certainly a, an important thing to know. I'm asking, take this probability, add it to this probability, add it to this probability, add it to this probability. Sum over all the Ks, look up the probabilities, and add those all together. And my question is, what is that sum going to be? Did anyone come up with an idea? Yes? So it'd be one. Why? It's because if you add up all of the um, probabilities in that space, then like, it should be one because all it's a probability that any of those events would happen. Yeah, I'm kind of asking what's the probability of the sample space, and that was one of the axioms of probabilities, because this is like the probability of or. You're adding, so it's like talking about the or of these mutually exclusive events. Are they mutually exclusive? Can you get a sum of two and a sum of three at the same time? No, they're definitely mutually exclusive. So this is the or. It's the probability that y equals two, or y equals three, or y equals four. And if you think about that or, it's saying, what's the probability of any outcome? And the probability of any outcome should be one. So if you have a proper random variable, if you sum over all the different inputs to the probability mass function, you should get a one. OK, fantastic. We have done one of those two things. That's it. Probability mass functions are simply somebody representing the relationship between a value a random variable can take on and its probability. We now just need to learn this next concept. It turns out if you have a random variable, there's things you can do to summarize that random variable. And one of the classic things you, you can give somebody an expectation. An expectation is something you've probably heard called a lot of different names. You might have heard it called the mean, the weighted average, the center of mass, the first moment, um, most likely the mean. And it's saying, if this is your random variable, kind of what's the most central outcome here? It summarizes your whole random variable in one statistic. It's a lossy statistic, but it's one that a lot of people find interesting. Before we talk about how we can use it, let's talk about how it's defined. It says, take your random variable, let's loop over all the values you can take on little x, and talk about the probability that x equals little x. So, you know, if I had to write this in our notation, I would make this probability that random variable x takes on the value little x. And what you saw on the slides is just shorthand for this because people get bored of writing x's so much. It says, take on, for every value, take on the value, the probability that it would take on that value, but we're going to multiply it by the value itself. So it's saying, you know, it can take on a one with this value, a two with this value, and we're going to take one times its probability, add it to two times its probability, and add it to three times its probability. And that gives us a number that some people find meaningful. Let's just start with our favorite good old friends when we're trying to understand a concept, dice. Here's my dice. It was a boring random variable. X is the boring random variable that's the outcome of the dice, but we can start asking this question, what's the expectation of X? The probability that x equals 1 is the same as probably that equals 2 is the same as probably that equals 6. All of those outcomes are 1, 6. The probability mass function was pretty straightforward. If we want to calculate the expectation, that's that statistic we can calculate on a random variable, we'd say take 1, multiply it by its probability. Add that to 2, multiply by its <coughs> probability. Add that to 3, multiply by its probability. 4, multiply by its probability. And up to 6, multiply by its probability. If there's other outcomes, we would include them. If you do all of this, you don't get a function, you get a number. An expectation will always give you a number. In this case, it gave us 
Is 3.5 the most likely outcome of rolling a dice? Like what? No, you can't roll a 3.5 on a dice. You can roll a three, you can roll a four. Um, but you can imagine this is kind of like the center outcome, like the most central outcome. It's the average between three and four. It's the value that's closest to each of the outcomes weighted by their probabilities. So if one of these was really, really likely, it would pull this number closer to one. If seven was really, really, or six was really, really likely, it would pull the outcome closer to six. So it's just a weighted average of the outcomes. Practice, let's say y is a random variable, it can take on three values, one, two, or three. If I, somebody asks you about the expectation, can you do this? Even if I haven't told you anything more about the random variable, like what it semantically means, if I just gave you the probability mass function written out as three statements, can you figure out the expectation? Yeah, absolutely. Just take each of those outcomes and multiply it by its probability. Um, so this is what expectation looks like in a slightly more general case. Okay, let's do something fun with this. There's three kinds of lies, lies, damn lies, and statistics. So when you summarize a random variable by one number, you lose a lot of information. People use this to manipulate other people. Let me give you an example. Universities, <laughs> they try and make it sound like all their classes are super small, and this is how they do it. Every university reports its average class size. But what they report to you is they report the expectation of class size if you were to choose a random class. Imagine a school with three classes. One class has five students, one class has 10 students, and one class has 150 students. To calculate this statistic that universities report, they imagine this thing. They say, randomly choose a class with equal probability. X is the size of the chosen class. What is the expectation of X? And to calculate this, they say, well, there's three outcomes of this, uh, the size of X. It could be five, 10, or 150. The chance that it's five is one third, because there's a one third chance you got that class. The chance of 10 is one third, and the chance of 150 is one third. And even though this class has, or this university has a class of 150 students, and most people are probably gonna be in that one, they report that their average class size is only 55. Convenient. <laughs> okay, let's be a little bit more cheeky. Let's say you randomly choose a student with equal probability, and now I want to know why is the size of the class that the student's in. This gives you a totally different number. And actually, just let's think about it for a second. We don't have to talk about the next next you, but like, think about how you would calculate this. What's the expectation of y now? The first thing you should ask yourself are, what are the values that y can take on? And it turns out y can stay, still only take on the values 5, 10, or 150. If you randomly pick a student, and assuming they're only in one of those three classes, you know, they could be in the class of size 5, they can be in the class of size 10, they can be in class of size 150. But what's the probability of each of those outcomes? The probability that you pick the student that's in the class of size 5 is 5 divided by the number of students in this university, 165. Each person is only in one class. The chance that you chose a student who's in the class of size 10 is 10 over 165. And the chance that you chose a person who's in the class of 150 is 150 by 165. So if you ask this question, you know, what's the expectation of the size of the class of a randomly chosen student, now it's 137. Expectations are a powerful tool. One of the reasons that they're powerful is they have these very, very amazing properties. But I do also want you to know that a lot of people give you misleading information using expectation. Expectation summarizes a whole random variable in one number. If I want a random variable given to me, I want somebody to give me the whole probability mass function. Tell me the probability of each of your outcomes. That's what I really care about. I don't just want a number that summarizes it into one value. So the probability mass function, full information, expectation, dumbs it down into one number. Now that one number is very useful to computer scientists though because it has some amazing properties. It turns out if you do a lot of transformations or weird manipulations to a random variable, like maybe x is the number of heads on a coin flip, but you're playing a game where you're gonna take that, multiply by number, and add another number to get the amount of profit you have, if you want to know the expectation of your profit, it turns out you could calculate it just by knowing the expectation of the underlying random variable of number of heads on your coin flips. So if you take any linear transformation of a random variable, multiply it by a normal variable, add in another normal variable, 
you would still get something that you could calculate without doing too much extra math. Uh, this is another amazing one. Now here I was adding a random variable to a non-random variable, so just like a constant. But it turns out if you have two random variables and you want to talk about the sum of those two random variables, no matter if they're independent or not, no matter if they're mutually exclusive or not, the expectation of the sum of random variables is always the sum of the expectations. This is amazing. So if I say this is the number of heads I get if I roll, flip 10 coins, and this is the number of sixes I get if I roll two dice, and if I want to talk about you know, the sum of those two numbers, the expectation of the sum of those numbers is equal to the expectation of the number of heads on my 10 flips plus the number of sixes on my 10 dice rolls. So if you want to do the expectation of sums, you have a very nice decomposition. Doesn't matter if they're independent or whatnot. And this is something we'll use in proofs. I'm going to talk about it a lot more once we use it. Uh, but I'm just going to list it now. We'll talk about it later. OK, so that's it. We have probability mass functions. We have expectations. That's what I wanted you guys to be comfortable with in terms of random variables going out of today's class. Wonderful. In that case, it's time to play a little game. We're going to play a game, and it's going to involve random variables and expectations. And it's a classic game that's kind of interesting to think about. Let me give you the setup. I have a fair coin. I got this thing off the internet, but I flipped it a whole bunch. I'm pretty sure it's fair. By fair, I mean it's equally likely to be heads or tails. It's not one of those frisbee things. I'm going to flip this coin until it comes up heads. All right, sorry, let me see. Sorry, I'm going to flip this coin until it comes up tails. So maybe I get a heads, I flip it again. I get a heads, I flip it again. I get a heads, I flip it again. I get a tails, the game is over. We're going to say n is the number of coin flips before my first tails. So it's how many times I flip the coin. Um, and then I'm going to win 2 to the power of n dollars. My question for you is, how much would you pay to play? And just my hint is, people often ask, answer this question by thinking about your expected winnings. How much do you expect to win if you played this game? And you would, if it, the cost to play the game is less than your expected winnings, you should probably pay it. So think about expectation in this harder situation. Random variable is how much you win. What are the different outcomes? You could win two to the one, you can win 2 to the squared. You can win 2 to the third. But what's the probability of each of those? Because you have to weight each of those outcomes by its probability, add it up, and then you get your expected winnings. I'm going to give you guys a second to think about it. I want you to answer the question, how much would you pay to play? And then we're actually going to play. Talk to the person next to you. Make friends. Oh, you guys want to know. OK. This is independent of the calculation you got. Is there anyone who would pay, play this game with me for $1,000? <laughs> in theory or in practice? In theory. OK, OK. No, no, I mean in practice. Like, you're going to step up and we're going to play this for $1,000. It depends on how many times I can play. <laughs> Once. You can pass. Very risky. I've, I've never had somebody take me up on it. Uh, I got a little sweaty there. <laughs> but on, in theory, it was a good decision, right? Why was it such a good decision? Because this really pushes the definition of expectation to its limit. Now, I, I do want to clarify one thing. I think there's two ways of reading this. If you get like a tails on your first flip, do you get um, 2 to the power of $1 or you get 2 to the power of $0? Depends how you think of before. So some people say this is going to be the number of heads is how many is n, and some people think number of coin flips is n. It doesn't matter how you interpret it. They both lead to the same answer. OK, solution. Define a random variable. Just like we used to define events, we're going to now get used to defining random variables. If somebody asks you an expectation question, the first thing you should do is define the random variable that they're asking you the expectation over. So x is your winnings. This is the version where if you get a tail on your first coin flip, you win 2 to the 0 dollars. If you get a heads then a tail, you win 2 to the first, sorry, heads then tails, you, get, you win 2 dollars. If you get heads, heads, tails, you win 2 squared dollars. If you get heads, 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 tails, you get 2 to the third. 
Now, what's the probability of getting a tails on your first coin flip? That's one half. What's the chance of getting a heads then a tails? One half times one half. What's the chance of getting heads, heads, tails? One half to the third. Heads, 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 tails, you guys get the point. And do you see this nice little pattern? I could write this formula into this beautiful little equation. I could say it's the sum from zero to infinity of one half to the power of i plus one times two to the power of i. And that's just taking, it's like, oh, this, this term has i and i plus one. And this one has i and i plus one. And if you work this out, I guess it really is important that, <laughs> well, okay, you would get even more money if I gave you the extra $2 for the heads. In this case, it's going to be, or how can we reduce this? You know, 2 to the i divided by 2 to the i plus 1 is just going to be equal to 1 over 2. And now that whole term becomes the sum from 0 to infinity of 1 half. And that's infinity. Your theoretical winnings of this game is infinite. Because even though it might not be that likely that you win $10,000, there's also a chance that you win like $10 trillion or like $20 trillion or like a gazillion infinite dollars. And this totally breaks this idea of expectation. Maybe it's another way to talk about how expectation isn't always the best summary of a random variable. But then I offer people this choice. I say, will you play this for $1,000? And I've been teaching 109 for a while and this is the closest we've ever gotten to somebody taking me up on it. And it's because even though in theory your expected wings are infinity, it feels too risky. And I have a very concrete way of articulating the risk. Chris doesn't have infinite dollars. If you play this game, but you win $65,536, you know what happens? I don't stay here and pay you, I split. I just run, I just leave the country, you never see me, you never get your winnings. So really, like, if you won $10,000, I might be like, okay, fair game. And if you win $20,000, I'd be like, fair game. But you win enough money and you're never ever seeing me. And you should take this into account when you think about whether or not you want to play this game. So same equation, <laughs> that's your chance of winning <laughs> to, uh, one dollar, this is your chance of winning two dollars, chance of winning three dollars. In the same equation, it's just that this doesn't go from zero to infinity. It's just going to go up to how many heads lead to sixty-five thousand uh, dollars. And the answer to that is sixteen. Like if you're up here getting fifteen, fourteen heads, I'm like, okay, fifteen heads, I'm booking my flight, sixteen <laughs> heads, I'm gone. And if you add one half to itself sixteen times, you are not very close to infinity. You are at $8.5. So I would say that this game is worth about $8.5 to play. <laughs> Not infinite. What a way to think about expectations. I know I've pushed the idea of expectation pretty hard, but hopefully that gives you a solid understanding of expectation going into the weekend. And hopefully you feel about, good about the learning goals, and I hope you guys have a great weekend. Enjoy. You've worked very hard. See you back in class on Monday.